land and feed on his faithfulness. The cure for worry here. Delight yourself in the Lord. Flip with me for a second to Matthew 6, 31. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 31. As it says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. So the Gentiles are focused on, you know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? How's everything going with me? You know, do I have... My 401k in proper order is everything straight, you know. Is every, you know, do I have things perfectly in order? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So again, not to worry, but trust in the Lord. Focus on the kingdom of God. And here as well it says, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Dwell in the land. We've heard the expression, bloom where you're planted. In other words, where God has you, be there. Don't just be constantly thinking, well, if I go to this place, things will be wonderful, or if I go to that place. If God wants to move you, he'll move you. But the point is to dwell in the land where he has you and feed on his faithfulness, trust in his faithfulness. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So, trust in the Lord and feed on his faithfulness. Then he says, and this third exhortation here, delight yourself also in the Lord, And he shall give you desire, the desires of your heart. Now, just, you know, if you, have you noticed something about, you know, beginning with this second exhortation? Thing that, it's one thing that kind of stands out is all this stuff is in the Lord. That you're trusting in the Lord. You're delighting yourself in the Lord. As when we get to... In verse 5, he says, commit your way to the Lord. Verse 7 says, rest in the Lord. This is all wrapped up, centered around your relationship with the Lord. And that's what David was focusing on here. Um, But to delight yourself also in the Lord. He said, trust in the Lord. And that's great. That's what we need to do. But we need to go beyond that as well. We need to delight ourselves also in the Lord. What's your delight? You ever think of that? That's more than a dessert, you know? You get desserts named Turkish Delight or something else like that. But you get the idea. It's something that you delight in. That, that thing is precious to you above other things. Above other things. Is the Lord your delight? Your delight above everything else. And if you will delight also in the Lord, it says he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, 
this can be taken a wrong way and a right way. And many from the prosperity perspective, it says, oh, I delight myself in the Lord. He'll give me what I want. You know, whether it be big car, new car. I saw out here in the parking lot from the weightlifting place earlier, there was a Mustang with a custom paint job, 5.2 liter engine GT, you know, setting out there. And, and I just say that I really wouldn't want it because I had a Mustang for a couple of years. It was fun to drive, but you can't put anything in it. You know, I the van I have now is more practical because I can, you know, we bought an armoire, you know, those big closet things in there. And we laid it down, stuck it in the back of that van, and it fit. you imagine trying to do that in a Mustang? But he says here, you know, the desires of your heart. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's not that he's going to give those, you those things that you lust after in your flesh. That would be contrary to his nature and contrary to his perfect will for your life because he doesn't want to destroy you with those things. If he gave us just everything we wanted in our flesh, we'd be spoiled brats. But what's meant by that is as we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. If we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, what's the desire of our heart? Himself. Again, like in Genesis chapter 15, when the Lord appears to Abram after his battle with the five kings and says, you know, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. If you delight yourself in the Lord... Truly, that is when you discover that he is the desire of your heart. And you, like Paul, pray or cry out that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to the image of his death, that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already attained it or already become perfect, but I press on. As it says, oh, I forget which prophet it was. One of them said, let us know. It's Jose or Habakkuk, one of those H guys, said, let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. Is the Lord your delight? Is he the desire of your heart to know him? In whatever you go into, in any circumstance, whatever he allows in your life, his purpose in allowing it is that you might know him in it. And he's tailor-made the circumstances of your life for just that purpose. So often we think God works in our lives so we can do great things for him. He doesn't need you for that. He can do it without you. Easy. The whole point is that we might know him. Not just intellectually. But personally and experientially. To know him. To delight in him. That's why he says, you know, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. That's why you stay where you are. If the Lord hadn't directed you anywhere else. And grow there and experience his faithfulness where you are. That you might know him. In your circumstances. And see him work in your life. Verse 5, commit your way 
to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Commit. The word commit means to rest. Rest your way. Commit your way to the Lord. We lose so much rest, so much peace. Personal confession here. Because we're so often trying to help God out with keeping everything straight. With our own lives. Oh, I got to do... You know, we can get on these trips about how well we're serving the Lord and how we're being judged in faithfulness, how we're judged in respect to our faithfulness. Oh, we do that, you know, and we get, we think so much depends on us. But the truth is what we need to learn is how much depends on him and how much, like the scripture says, um, casting all our cares on him in Colossians because he cares for you. So commit your way to the Lord. Turn your life over to him. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation is, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. Lord, here's what the situation is, is in my life. My life is out, the rest of my life, however long that might be, is out here before you, Lord. I'm committing it to you. Whether it be, you know, job, spouse, you know, career, ministry, whatever those things might be, commit them to the Lord. Commit them to the Lord. And in that Colossians passage, when, when it's talking about casting all our cares upon him, what it means is to roll them over on him. It's like, you know, you ever carry something like different times I've carried like long rugs or sections of carpet, you know, and you're carrying them on. And how do you get that off your shoulder? You have to roll it off onto wherever you're putting it, whether it be in a truck or something like that or even on a shelf and in your garage you just kind of have to roll it off and that's the picture there you know to commit your way to the Lord trust also in him and he'll bring it to pass notice what's required there though is trust trust also in him and he'll bring it to pass. He'll make, he'll, he shall bring your righteousness, bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. He's going to work out the details. He's, every time it mentions righteousness in the scriptures, we so often think of, you know, how much right I'm doing and, you know, the right, you know this show us how, people how really great I am. No, that's not what it's talking about at all. But what it will demonstrate in righteousness, what we always have to think about when the scripture talks about righteousness, is our right standing with him. It's not how good I am, because I'm not. It's my right standing with him. And what's demonstrated as we commit our way to the Lord, as he works it out in our life and brings it to pass, we're demonstrating what it means to have a relationship with the Lord. We're living it out, and people see that witness as we're putting our trust in him. And justice, equity, 
as the noonday. Now verse 7. Rest also in the Lord. Rest is the natural result of commitment. Once you've cast once we've cast all our cares upon him, once we've you know rolled those concerns over on him, committed our way to the Lord, the result is rest. We don't have to stress about it. We're trusting the Lord. And you know the cool thing, and the reason we can rest, the reason we can trust, is because He can handle it. He can handle it. But we fret and we get stressed out when we're trying to deal with things because we can't handle them. We don't have the capacity because we don't have control over everything. Not a single one of us here are sovereign. We can't control everything. Even people in the world like royalty, who the term sovereign is used to refer to them, they're not sovereign. They might rule over the country, but they can't control everything that goes on in the country. God is the only one to whom that attribute is justifiably attributed. He's the only one that's sovereign. As we read in the New Testament, he's the one and only potentate, the one and only one who's in complete control. Um, So, rest in the Lord. Notice this next phrase there. And wait patiently for him. Ooh. That's the hard part of all of this. Okay. I can trust in the Lord and do good. And dwell in the land. But what about those times? And he just says to wait. To rest. Yeah, you're cool. But trust him for the end result. That's the difficult part, to simply wait on the Lord. Then again, do not fret another exhortation. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Boy, that's hard to do these days. We can see, if we look, a lot of wickedness in our world. But he says here, and this is applicable to our situation, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, the wicked who seems to prosper, because of the man who brings a wicked schemes to pass. The people who do wicked things in the world. You think of things today like human trafficking. You think of some of these political things going on where you see obvious wickedness. You see, what's his name who had his island, you know, where he's taking young girls to and politicians and everybody going to and from that island and you see the blatant wickedness very often of people in power but we're not to fret over that And we'll get to here further. He says, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings forth wicked scheme, brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. 
Don't get caught up in things you have no control over. Because, you know, that's what worry actually means. It's concern over something over which you have no control. It's right to be concerned about things that you can deal with. But we shouldn't, again, back to Philippians 4, 6 and following, is we're not to be anxious for anything, but to pray about everything. And again, that's committing our way to the Lord. That's trusting in the Lord. That's delighting in the Lord. Is when we can sincerely and honestly Roll those things over on the Lord and look ultimately to the Lord for the solution and that we can cease from anger and forsake wrath. And not fret. Because if I think I have to deal with it and there's, you know, I can get steamed up. I can boil but he says here that only causes harm. And now as we continue here, David lays out some contrast between the evil doer and the righteous. As he says in verse 9, For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For a little while, for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth. We've heard that before. The Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Lord quoting from Psalm 37, 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The person that they think they're in control, they think that they can do whatever they want and get away with it. To use a term that my mother used to use, those type of people are full of themselves. God looks at them, he sa- it says here, and he laughs. He says, seriously? For someone to stand before a sovereign God and say, hey, I'm in control, I got this, God just laughs. Have at it, bud. But your day is coming. No matter what wicked person you see out there and what they're getting, see, apparently getting away with at the time, no. And this is an important thing for us to remember because it's how we can have peace in the midst of an incredibly wicked and crazy world. We know justice is coming. Ultimate justice is coming. Not this political type of justice where people compromise on this and that and redefine terms and do all of that sort of stuff. Real justice is coming. And we've seen so often how people with power or money can get away with things, apparently. Seemingly, but ultimately no one gets away with anything. 
no one gets away with anything. And the only hope is to find salvation in Christ. Because it's either we allow him to pay for our sins or we do it for ourselves. And we can't. Verse 14, the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent the bow and cast down the poor and needy to slay those who are, up, who are of upright conduct. The sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. As it says in Galatians 6, do not be deceived God will not be mocked for whatever a man sows that he shall also reap. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the wicked. In 1 Timothy 6.6 6, it tells us that godliness with contentment is much gain. Great gain. Godliness with contentment. The scripture also tells us if, you know, our, if our wealth, our riches increase, not to set our eyes on them. Because that stuff leaves. It comes, it goes. A little that the righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. We can send it ahead. It's the only thing we can send ahead. You know, we, can, we can't keep things here. We can't, you know, the expression, he who dies with the most toys wins. Wins what? You have nothing when you <laughs> die and, the, and all the toys are gone. But, As it says here, he knows the days of the upright. He knows how long you're going to live. He knows the condition or the situation of your death. Not a surprise to him. He knows, as the scripture tells us, the number of our days. And we can't keep anything we have here. But the fruit of it, we can send ahead. The benefits of it, if we use it for the kingdom of God, we use it for God's purposes, we send it ahead. As Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and where the thief can't break in and steal. Verse 19, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Just basically saying, God's going to take care of them. God's going to take care of you. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, all that grass, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. You've seen before a green meadow or pasture. Oh, you get the old clover flowers popping up in there and all these different wildflowers and you look out, 
oh, how great that looks. What he's saying is, is that what the rich of this age, the rich wicked, are like. They look really great for a short time. But then they vanish away. Verse 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay, taking advantage of people, finding out how they can not pay it back, finding loopholes. But the righteous shows mercy and gives. The wicked are about getting. Getting and getting and getting. The righteous are about giving. How I can minister to someone else. It's the and that's true in again, that's the principle, what's been called in some circles the law of reciprocity. And again, it goes with, you know, it's the opposite side of, you know, um, don't be deceived, God won't be mocked, whatever a man sows, he'll also reap. Well, the positive side of that is, you know, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Will men give unto your bosom, Jesus said, because, you know, it's the idea of, you know, them having their robe pulled up and somebody keeps filling, and filling their robe with grain there and it's spilling over all over the place. You can't outgive God. You can't. Verse 22, for those, for those blessed by him shall inherit the earth. There we have that again. But those cursed by him shall be cut off. And here we get guidance again as well as we look at verse 23. The steps of a good man, again, good having to do with our relationship with the Lord, are ordered by the Lord. Established is another word there, another a synonym for the word ordered there. The steps of a good man are ordered or established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So he's saying a good man, good woman, they're led by the Lord, and the Lord delights in leading his people. He delights in the fruit of their lives. He delights in what's happening as a result of their relationship with him and them walking it out. That he delights in it. Verse 24, though he fall, excuse me, he shall not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholds him with his hand. Even though he has problems, he won't be utterly destroyed. Verse 25, another powerful verse here from David. Think about David. This is probably coming towards the end of his life somewhere. He says, I have been young, and now I'm old. Okay. And in all this time, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Ultimately, that's, he's, he's saying, ultimately, my experience has been, my observations have been, I've never seen God forsake the righteous. God will always work things out for people. All things working together for good for those who love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. He is ever merciful and lends 
and his descendants are blessed. Again, we see that evidence of a righteous person being the fact that they're a giving person as well. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. This is really, this section here is David's appeal, his exhortation again, but as an appeal for what to do, what to take home from this psalm. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore in eternity. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. There are eternal consequences to the way we live our lives. That's what David's spelling out for us here. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. And his tongue talks of justice. The law of God is in his heart. Referring to the righteous. The law of God's in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord. Now, every time you see that expression, wait on the Lord, it's not talking about waiting in passivity. It means wait expectantly. You're looking, for, you're looking toward the Lord. You're looking toward what he's going to do. You're looking for in a sense, a sign that he's moving so that he can go along with him. It's that looking with expectation. It's that waiting with expectation. Okay, I'm waiting. What are you going to do, Lord? It's kind of like my dogs. It's funny. At certain times of the day, twice a day, they get fed. And around when that time comes around, they watch my every movement. Like I have three heads going like this. Shh, shh, up, down. <laughs> you know, just watching what I'm doing. And that's kind of the picture here. It, to wait on him is to look expectantly toward him, for him. Not to just say, well, I just got to wait. Let me find something else to do. No, it's that looking with expectancy. God, what are you going to do? Let's do it, Lord. What do you have? So wait on the Lord and keep his way. You know, walk in faithfulness. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Interesting that he mentions that a native green tree. Have you ever, we had the house we owned before in Fort Myers. The previous owners planted an apple tree. This is South Florida. Apple trees don't grow in South Florida. It stayed alive, but it never really grew. Never bore fruit. Just kind of hung out there. You know. <laughs> but as he says here, the wicked, you know, he might be spreading himself out like a native green tree. He looks really fruitful. He's planted in the right place. You know, a lot of leaves. Seems to, you know, have it all. Verse 36, Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he couldn't be found. 
Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. I love that. He's saying, Mark the blameless man. Observe the upright. Look at him. Watch what goes on in their life. See the, you know, note the contrast he's saying. You look at the righteous man. See how he's established. You look at the wicked. See what, you know, look down the long run. Don't just look today, oh, one's got a lot of money, has a lot of stuff, the other doesn't. No, look down the long haul, down the road. What ultimately comes of their life. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Salvation, deliverance is from the Lord. He delivers the righteous. He promises to and he will. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. them beli- deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him because they trust in him now psalm 38 it's kind of interesting you know i've heard a couple of things you, you know you try to get the backstory on on these different psalms excuse me a second take a sip You know, try to find the backstory on these psalms so you can see, well, what exactly that he, is he talking about? Um, on the one hand, I've heard, read that, um, that, was, that it was written around Yom Kippur, which we just celebrated. Well, we didn't celebrate because we're not Jewish, but the Jewish people celebrated on a Monday the Day of Atonement. And so that was a, a, a psalm. That was recited or sung surrounding the Day of Atonement. Um, so there's confession in it, confession of sin, that sort of thing. Others say that it was a confession of David's personal sin and that it was sometime around the rebellion of Absalom. So, whichever one it is, we'll see here the caption over it in my Bible, again, not inspired, but there to label it. It was like a chapter or paragraph heading. It says, Prayer in the time of chastening. When it's experiencing, when you're experiencing the discipline of the Lord. How to act, how to, you know, what's the perspective here? So in verse 1, David begins. Do not, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For, the air, for your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. I'm feeling it heavy, he's saying here, Lord. He's saying, you know, feeling really the weight of his sin. Verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin, the physical consequences. And in this we'll find that 
yes, what David is talking about is there being physical consequences for sin, for his particular sin. Some have speculated that it was a sexually transmitted disease. Don't know. I don't really think we're given enough information to say that. But you get the idea that there is, you know, you occasionally you get into that discussion is, well, like the disciples asked Jesus about the blame guy, I think it was. What? Born blind. The man that was born blind. Yeah, whose sin was it? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither one, but that, you know, the work of God might be manifest in his life. So, you know, that wasn't really what he was saying there. It wasn't related to sin there. But there are occasions, there are circumstances where sickness is a consequence of sin. You can't go wrong analyzing people and say, oh, your sickness is obviously because you have sin in your life. No, don't go there. God doesn't call us to judge those things. But there are those times when that is true. And David is experiencing that. He says in verse 3, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. You get that picture of water being going over you. And that's what he said his iniquity was like. It was too much for him. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. You know, this is the part of sin that the world doesn't talk about. It doesn't talk about outcomes. Oh, you can do this. You can get away with this. You know, don't be a prude. You know, all of that stuff you hear over and over again. But what they don't tell you about is the outcome. when they talk about a promiscuous lifestyle, they don't talk about sexually transmitted diseases. They don't talk about the consequences of that type of lifestyle. They just talk about, oh, this is so great, all of this stuff. We're free, all this. Ah, You're not free when you're bound in sin. Verse 6, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long, for my loins are full of inflammation, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Gets, he gets emotional here. Lord, all my desire is before you. And my sighing is not hidden from you. Lord, you know. You know exactly where I'm at. What I desire, you know. What's going on in my heart and my life, you know. My heart pants. My strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. The light of the eyes is the idea of, you know, elsewhere in the scripture it refers to the brightness of your countenance. It's like the light of your eyes. As an expression that you're doing well, that things are good, but taking it away is the brightness of my eyes. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just miserable here. 
my loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my relatives stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus, I am like a man who does not hear and whose mouth has no response. And all of this and all that he's going through, he just sits there without response. For in you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. As he cries out to the Lord in the midst of that situation. Being there, stuck in that situation, and there being absolutely nothing he can do about it. He cries out to the Lord. And so often, that's what the Lord does, is to get us in a position where we cry out to him that we can't do things on our own, realize, we, brings us to the point where we realize we can't do things on our own. We can't control the circumstances. So we cry out to him. For I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me, lest when my foot slips, they exalt themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, confessing his sin. I will be in anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous, and they are strong. And those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. Just solely, he's saying solely because I look to what is good, people are my adversaries. And you'll find that to be true. Because there's those in the world who call good evil and evil good. So don't be surprised by it. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Psalm 39 says to the chief musician, to Jeduthun, believed to be a musician there, another psalm of David, and again, because it's to the chief musician, it was intended to be sung publicly. Verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. The scripture says in the multitude of words, sin isn't far off. <laughs> He's slow to speak. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Notice that. Interesting. Even before the wicked being silent. I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing or meditating, the fire burned. 
Then I spoke with my tongue. But notice who he's speaking with his tongue to. Now he's saying this is the situation. You know, I've held this back. Because as, you know, think about it these days. As we do look at all the sin, all the iniquity in the world, do we take a realistic look at ourselves as well? That's what David's talking about here as he goes on in verse 4 and says, Lord, make me to know my end. Help me to understand the brevity of life, that this isn't going on forever. And what is the measure of my days? That I may know how frail I am. Scripture tells us our life is like a vapor. A vapor. One good thing about people vaping today is it gives you a good illustration. You see the people vaping out there when they exhale up, they exhale, you see the vapor just quickly dissolves away. Quickly dissolves away. And that's what he's saying. I mean, you see steam coming off a pot that's boiling. How long is that steam there? Not long. So he's making that comparison, using that analogy here that I might realize really how short life is. And it's amazing, though, it seems to be a characteristic of mankind that we already act as if we're immortal. People never think about, rarely think about death, the fact that they'll die. I think, you know, it amazes me when you look at, you know, old wicked people. And you think, how long do you think you can do this? How long do you think you can continue in this? Those who are taking advantage of other people, you know, get the theatrical picture of someone like an Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, how you're that old, and you think this is going to go on forever. You keep taking advantage. You keep accumulating wealth. What good do you think it's going to do you? And the, just the idiocy of it. Because, you know, you're accumulating all this stuff. You don't realize... You know, maybe you're pushing 80 years older stuff and you're still doing all this. And it's like, what do you think is going to happen? You think you're going to get push a reset button? No, they're coming to the end there. So he says, help me to, that I might know how frail I am. Verse Five, indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths. And my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man is at best, at his best state is a vapor. Even when everything's going the best for you, you're the, at the height of your career, you have all the possessions you ever wanted, even at that point, your life is like a vapor. It can be snuffed out at any time. And notice here as well, he says, you know, you have made my days like hand breaths. This is a hand breath. My days are like hand breaths. They're short. You know, when you go measuring things, you know, when you want a length of something, you don't go measuring fence, you know, fencing material or something like that by hand breaths. It's too small. You go by feet at least. Doing carpet, you yards. How many square yards? Oh, would you give me uh, 300 square hand breaths, please? You don't do it because it's short. The idea is that it's a shortened length. Verse 6, 
Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. Apt description. Verse 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? David saying here, Lord, in the midst of all this, as I look at all this, as I'm quiet and, you know, it, these sinners and how they're accumulating stuff for themselves, help me to understand myself here, Lord. But Lord, what is my perspective to be? What do I wait for? What do I long for, Lord? And he says, my hope is in you. Where is your hope? To whom are you looking? For the government's next check? Stimulus? Deliver me from my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because... It was you who did it. Talking to God. You're sovereign. You're in control of the situation, Lord. I was looking to you in the situation. So I kept my mouth shut. We would do well to do that a lot more often. To keep our mouth shut. And look to what the Lord's doing in the circumstances. You know, we're really quick to judge other people. Even other believers. Oh, they're doing that? Why are they doing that? When, if there's not blatant, obvious sin in the situation, keep your mouth shut. See what God's doing. He works different people, different ways at different times. Verse 10, remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is a vapor. Says that again, and... It seems like every time in this psalm he says he says that man or his life is like a vapor, it's followed by the word, I skipped it the first time, but the word sila, which basically means stop and think about this. Your life's a vapor. Stop. Meditate on that for a minute here before we go on. <laughs> you know, think. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Now, when he's saying he's a stranger and a sojourner, he's not talking about being separated from God, but he's talking about living as a stranger in the earth and that he's just a sojourner here. A sojourner is a temporary resident, a tourist. Somebody who's come who lives here, you know, gets one of those houses that are seasonal rentals and hangs out for about a month and leaves. Goes and sees the sights. But that's the way I am here. Verse 13, remove your gaze from me that I might regain strength before I go away and am no more. So he's talking about, again, God's hand on his life in, in the sense that of uh, discipline, in the sense of discipline in the sense of growing him and maturing him as well. Because it says in Hebrews, 
quoting from the Old Testament. You know, God chastens those whom he loves. And that no chastening at the moment is pleasurable or enjoyable. But the outcome is the peaceable fruit of righteousness by those who are trained by it. And that's what we see here with David in Psalm 39. And also as well in 38 is a man being trained by the discipline of God. We all should be trained by the discipline of God in the things that we go through. Looking to him, trusting in him, seeing him work in our lives, waiting expectantly for him, finding our hope in him, delighting ourselves in him, and bearing fruit. That's where the fruit comes from being focused on him. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word and just how incredible it is, Lord. As I read these psalms, Father, I just, as I look at them, I just think, Lord, you got me pegged. You know the depths of my heart. Lord, you know my every thought. And Lord, you work in my life accordingly to bring about a good end. To demonstrate your faithfulness. Lord, to prepare me and to prepare each one of us, Lord, for eternity. Lord, we thank you for that. Even though the times at the moment we might be experiencing difficulty. But Lord, you're bringing about the peaceable fruit of righteousness, Lord. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.